just uh, good morning, everybody who's on so far. Uh, my name is Tomas Breslin. I'm a consultant in emergency medicine in the Matter Hospital and Ireland East Hospital Group training lead. And together with my colleague, Dr. Shane O'Hanlon, consultant geriatrician in Vincent's, we, um, we organize these monthly IEHG grand rounds meetings, but we very often involve other hospital groups and we're, we're quite keen to do that. So we have uh, RCSI group on board today as well. And uh, I just ask everybody in, so if you go to participants and go to your own name, and if you just can rename yourself as possibly where you work um, and your specialty if possible. I think I recognize a lot of you, but it's just for, for the purposes of uh, recording the attendance. Um, and um, so as, a, as, as a, an attendee at the meeting, you can't unmute, we can unmute you, but the best way to communicate is to use the question and answers uh, tab at the bottom or the chat tab, uh, and we'll deal with questions. Um, you can raise your hand and we request to be unmuted and we can certainly unmute you. So there's no problem there if, if you wish to speak. And um, we'll try and stick to the questions and answers and the chat format. So, um, so we have a, a very uh, lively panel on this morning. Um, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Maggie O'Brown, Maternal Medicine Fellow, um, presenting on behalf of the Maternity Hospital Cases of Stroke at Extremes of Pregnancy. We have Dr. Matt Crockett, Neuroradiologist from Beaumont, Dr. Colin Quigley, uh, Consultant Physician um, in Wexford, Dr. Fanula McAuliffe in the, from the National Maternity Hospital, Car Carl Boyle, um, Stroke Physician in Beaumont and Roger McMorrow, consultant in Aesthetist, and Shane O'Han and myself. So um, without further ado, I'll hand you over to Maggie to present the cases. Thanks, William Tomas. So um, I'm delighted to be here. My name is Maggie O'Brien. Uh, as Tomas mentioned, I'm the Maternal Medicine Fellow in Hollis Street at the minute, uh, and we're presenting on stroke at extremes of pregnancy. Um, yeah, so thank you to the Ireland East Hospital Group Training uh, Group to invite us here to speak today. Uh, we have two cases for discussion and they'll bring us to two very different places. So it'll be an exciting discussion, I hope. Um, you're very welcome to share my slides on Twitter. I would just ask you not to share any case information or case images. Uh, these are real patients and real cases. So we'll jump in. Uh, the first case is a 23 year old woman, Shapiro Wooden no real past medical or past surgical history and was taking the combined oral contraceptive pill and no known drug allergies. She presented to Wexford with a three hour history of a facial droop and speaking difficulties. On examination, she was noted to have a severe expressive and mild receptive aphasia and speech apraxia. She went on to have a, a non-contrast CT which showed an evolving left MCA segment infarct um, and had a CT angio which didn't, ident uh, didn't identify any thrombus. So the decision was for thrombolysis in Wexford following discussion with Beaumont. She had some improvement in symptoms following the thrombolysis. And during her workup, um, she had an MRI brain which showed a, a left frontal lobe infarct and confirmed the diagnosis. She had an echo which identified a, a PFO and was referred to St. James's Hospital for closure. She was discharged on day 12 to the rehab unit uh, on pantoprazole aspirin um, following a loading with 300 milligrams for two weeks and a torvastatin. While she was awaiting a review in, for, um, in St. James's for the closure of the patent for Amino Valley, she discovered she was pregnant. She's currently well, 17 weeks pregnant now, and no residual deficits and attending the maternal medicine clinic here in Hollis Street. She was commenced on 100 units of, uh, per kilo of low molecular weight heparin and a statin was stopped at booking. So likely this woman was around three to four weeks pregnant, um, possibly not even um, diagnosable on a, a urine uh, HCG. Uh, but the question I want to kind of pose to the, the audience today, and, and think about this as I'm going through stroke and pregnancy, uh, what would you have done if you'd found out this woman is pregnant? How would have it, it impacted your care of this woman? Would you have um, thrombolized as normal? Would there have been a delay to her thrombolysis or would you have held it off entirely? Uh, and would it have impacted your choice of imaging? So stroke and pregnancy, uh, it affects 30 per 100,000 pregnancies uh, and it's increasing. So this is an old study now from 2011, uh, but it showed that the uh, rate of stroke increased um, over a 10 year period. Um, antenatally was, I can't see my slides, 47% and 89% postnatally. 
And why is this happening? Probably increasing maternal age and women are getting pregnant uh, with um, different morbidities. Um, so this uh, is some data from the uh, UCOS, is the UK uh, obstetric surveillance system. Um, and they uh, broke it down risk factor uh, and the odds ratio for the individual risk factors. And you can see that the pregnancy related risk factors, diabetes uh, and preeclampsia um, contribute quite heavily to that. Why does stroke happen in pregnancy? Uh, well, there's a number of reasons. So physiological changes in pregnancy, uh, we have the upregulation of clotting factors um, approaching the labor and delivery, pregnancy specific hypercoagulability, um, which cause intravascular depletion. So uh, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, um, uh, hyperemesis and preeclampsia. And then you have pro-thrombotic medical conditions in pregnancy, such as antiphospholipid. Uh, hypertensive disease increases the risk of both ischemic and hemorrhagic. And you see in pregnancy um, a pretty even slip, split between ischemic and uh, hemorrhagic strokes. So thrombolysis um, is not, pregnancy is not a contraindication to thrombolysis. Um, we believe that it doesn't cross the placenta. And if you're ever consenting these women for thrombolysis, their first question will be, how is this going to affect my baby? Uh, this is a nice review article from 2019, which looked at um, women who had received thrombolysis for various reasons. Um, and it showed uh, two fetal deaths in this group, 1.4% uh, and nine miscarriages, 6.4% and 12 major bleeding episodes. Um, so the Embrace report um, is um, a, a report that comes out of the UK looking at maternal mortality and they drill into the different causes of um, these women who passed away. Um, they, so the um, advice from them, they drill into these kind of um, events and look at the pitfalls or the failings and the care that, that these women received and it does make for grim breeding uh, but the advice that comes out of these reports is really helpful so they say that pregnancy should not alter the standard of care for stroke neither pregnancy cesarean section nor the immediate postpartum state are absolute contraindications to thrombolysis uh, clot retrieval or craniectomy Imaging in pregnancy, I think we all know this, CT and MRI are safe, um, but I think it's worth reiterating that uh, fetal radio radiation exposure is less than 0 0.005 milligrays using uh, lead shielding, and the effects to the fetus occur at doses of greater than 100. Um, so if you're consenting these women for CT, I think that's a really valuable piece of information to, to um, transmit to them. Uh, contrast is not indicated, uh, not contraindicated, uh, and MRI is not contraindicated at any stage. Gadolinium should be used if you feel that the benefit outweighs the risk, um, and so it can be used in limited cases. So I'm just going to open it up now and I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Colm Quigley, who is the physician involved in this case uh, in Wexford, uh, and um, I'd be interested to hear the context that uh, he has about this case. So Colm, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, this young woman, uh, around 8.30 in the morning, when her partner had gone to work, uh, could not speak. She had a three-year-old at home. She handed the phone to the three-year-old and said, Nana. We got this from our speech and language therapist later on, where we got some background detail. So the child managed to recognize the grandmother's number and called grandmother to say, mommy can't speak. The other important piece of information is that this patient's mother had a stroke at 42 years of age or, uh, and made a good recovery, but had still residual speech dysfunction and comprehension problems, but was able to understand on this occasion what was happening. Uh, and that colored this uh, young woman's um, decision-making later on because she had a very clear expressive dysphasia uh, and the receptive dysphasia was, was fairly subtle. I have to make it clear, the communication problem was for speech only. She was able to understand signs and, and um, uh, handwritten information. But the problem was by the time she got to the ED in Wexford, three hours elapsed by the time an ambulance picked her up and got her in. If somebody had put her into a car and driven her in, it would have been even better. Uh, that wasn't available. But we were not aware that she was pregnant at the time. In fact, looking at this, 
she either had become pregnant the week before or 10 days beforehand. Uh, this was a Thursday. Um, when we look at our timeline and our audit of this, um, it, it, there was a question initially about the history, whether this might be a migraine episode. Anyway, she got her scans done in a fairly timely fashion. But what was really helpful was the help we got from Beaumont Radiology, where a phone call was replied to more or less instantaneously. But we had a, a slight delay because the um, uploading on the Nimbus system to, to Beaumont just took a bit longer. Um, I was called into the resource room by the registrar on call uh, very rapidly. The radiologist in Wexford, I was in her office looking at the images with her. We couldn't see a thrombus. We asked our uh, expert colleagues in neuroradiology in Beaumont um, to look at. And I think they felt there wasn't any evidence of clot uh, that they could remove. But I had more or less made a decision that if we didn't get the images to Beaumont fast, that we would have to try and rescue brain here. Uh, her partner had arrived in. Uh, I discussed the options about trying to rescue brain. And I put it starkly in those terms. Um, the, the worry I had was that the scan showed an evolving infarct and the contraindication, a relative contraindication, would have been to give TPA because of the risk of bleeding in all comers. But I thought at a, a woman of this age group, the risk was going to be small in terms of brain bleed and that we might rescue brain. Um, but what actually swung it very strongly was talking with them and outlining the issues was this young woman did not want to have the same neurological deficit as her mother, and she was desperate to have her speech rescued. Um, so she had a facial weakness, definite expressive dysphagia, and she looked pretty terrified, And was, but she gave clear consent. We went ahead and gave the TPA. Um, 98 minutes after she arrived in casualty, she got her first piece of TPA and her facial symptoms disappeared within the first hour. Um, the numbness facial asymmetry disappeared and her NIHS score from five went down to two. I have to emphasize that if you have a dysphasia, that counts as a major neurological deficit because your future life and communication skills um, would be greatly impaired. And afterwards, she spent 12 days in the acute unit. We did the full stroke workup, confirming that she had a, a patent for Ramon Valley. And what was clear from this was that the desire to get her rescued fast um, was hampered a little bit by her COVID status. And the question was, did she have a, a COVID positive infection? And um, that came through a bit later on, uh, but that did slow things down. And subsequently, we've gone through this case line by line, I suppose, looking at where we could have speeded things up. And uh, she did not have a pregnancy test at the front door. The outcome down the road was that she did very well with speech and language, but went then to a rehab unit, but couldn't stand it um, because she was in a place where a lot of adults had severe neurological deficits and she left but she continued her speech and language input and has made a, a very good recovery. And indeed, I'm due to see her uh, in the 10th of November for follow-up. She has a PFO closure booked, um, but this has to be deferred to the end of pregnancy. And ideally, she would be on heparin uh, where possible, but this is something that you'll probably discuss. She doesn't necessarily wish to have and is on aspirin. But uh, at, at discharge, at the last um, assessment, her receptive dysphasia, very subtle that it was, seems to have cleared, and her expressive dysphasia has increased enormously, uh, has improved enormously. So she's had a very good outcome. If I had known she was pregnant, I would have said to her, um, in my opinion, you need to uh, have your brain rescued, um, and that given your age, uh, that the risk to you, to your bleeding, would be very low and that you would likely um, have a good result with this and that we wouldn't be able to tell you what the outcome would be for your baby but we would feel we'd have to weigh up rescuing your brain as much as possible um, and that's more or less what i'll say i'd be happy to discuss further 
Thanks, Dr. Quigley. Uh, yeah, that's a very interesting. Uh, uh, I just have a, a query column. Presumably with her PFO, there was um, a query about a venous clot shunting to yeah, the Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and did she have, um, I just a curious, did she have Doppler scans or C, uh, CTPA or? No, no, we didn't go ahead with any further imaging. Uh, she was simply starting anticoagulation. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. No, I just, just wonder. Um, Very interesting. No, we talked with our cardiac colleagues that said no value in it unless you have, uh, there was no suggestion clinically of pulmonary emboli. And yeah. The, their view is no point going looking unless she's an obvious DVT or something like that, which she did not. Now, am I okay. correct in saying that she had a negative D-dimer, Dr. Quigley? Um, no, the D-dimer was up subsequently after the TPA. Uh, Roger McMorrow here. Did you know she had the PFO prior to it or was that a subsequent finding? Uh, oh, no, that was part of this, the young stroke workup. Um, Two things came back with her when we was her patent for amino valley. Um, and the other thing is her homocysteine level was slightly up, but was the, the bubble test on her echo was a new finding, was not known. And she had a previous pregnancy in 2017, and there was no suggestion of anything at that time. But I have to emphasize that the value of discussion, our own stroke lead, M. O'Sullivan. I got hold of her. I was talking to her own radiologist and then talking to Beaumont Neuroradiology. And I su suspect Matt is on the line there. Um, it was extraordinarily helpful to have uh, people talking fast and furiously, I'd have to say, because we were losing time uh, with every conversation. Um, Fanula McAuliffe here. It, Colin, it sounds like you acted very quickly and appropriately. Um, I think Maggie poses some excellent questions there in terms of um, if she was pregnant, would it have impacted on the choice of imaging and decision to give thrombolysis? I suspect it would have delayed things quite significantly. Yeah, You're quite correct. It, it, it would have, I'm there. sure. And I think one of the things we do see is that when pregnancy is diagnosed, then people are concerned naturally and appropriately about safety of imaging and treatment. But um, as you can see from what Maggie presented there in the Embrace report, um, really in an emergency situation, treatment should not differ and the priority is the mother's life. And I think um, had, had we known she was pregnant, there could have been a concern about whether or not to give thrombolysis or not. And uh, I think it's clear this was the right decision. So I think you, uh, it, this was very handled very well. Yeah, yeah. The only issue, I suppose, is whether the risk of bleeding into her infarct was too high. But I think when you look at all comers data, you then have to factor in the youth of this person who is just 23. So the, the hope was that her brain was <laughs> blood vessels were better than uh, older patients. Um, it's Roger again. Um, I, I think one of the useful questions to someone or to ask someone who's dealing with um, uh, an acutely ill uh, uh, pregnant patient um, is to ask the question, what would you do if she wasn't pregnant and do that? Because we, we often find, as, um, as Maggie presented there, that the, the, the right thing to do is the thing you would do if she wasn't pregnant. And that's often a, a good question to pose to someone who's uh, having a, a treatment dilemma uh, with someone who's acutely ill. And I, I've asked myself the same question and I would have done the same. Um, I, I have an interest in this, uh, by the way, because my own wife, uh, 39 and 36 years ago, had hemiplegic migraines, which left her paralyzed um, on one side and speechless for an hour at a time. Um, and it just turned out to be reversible migraine. But uh, she, she had a fairly frightening two episodes and uh, uh, didn't have any subsequent pregnancies because of that. But the, the issue, from my point of view, I actually had kept up with the literature of stroke and pregnancy because one of our daughters got a hemiplegic migraine, um, which again was uh, left her uh, without power or speech for an hour and a half. 
Um, and what's interesting back uh, the in Calgary, there had been some interesting work being done in 2013, 2014 on TPA in pregnancy. I think it was a guy with a new Ukrainian name, Donchenko or Demchenko or Demchuk, perhaps. And the consensus exactly as was said, you should treat um, pregnant patients with serious uh, evolving stroke as you would if they were non-pregnant. No, I think that that's very good advice. I might just jump in with, with a comment. So it's, it's great to hear that message coming out that you know pregnant women should be treated the same way as non-pregnant women when it comes to an acute stroke. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Uh, and often when pregnancy is part of the picture, it does delay things significantly, complicate things. Unfortunately, it is considered by many as a contraindication to thrombolysis. Obviously, pregnant women weren't involved in any of the pivotal trials using thrombolysis. So there's like many things in pregnancy, there's not a clear evidence base to support the treatment. So it's very common for people not to receive thrombolysis because they're pregnant. And, and it's a very important message to say that if the expected benefits are to outweigh the expected risks, which probably does confer an increased risk of uterine bleeding, and I think the fact that TPA doesn't cross the placenta is very reassuring, then in a moderate to severe stroke, you know, certainly most of the international guidelines would recommend thrombolysis. So it's, you know, not a contraindication, but is considered by many to be a contraindication. And then I think the other thing when that does come into play is it significantly slows things down and, and complicates things. And, and I guess this case also highlights the challenges of stroke in the young because stroke mimics are more common in stroke in the young and there is usually more delays with making the diagnosis. And uh, so that's a, 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 an increased challenge in younger patients coming in. For example, migraines, as you've mentioned, are, are more common in that younger population. So, so it is a challenge. And I think if this lady had been known to pregnant, I don't think they, um, it's possible that the timelines may not have been as, as quick and um, so it's very, you know, I think it is very important to, to reaffirm and stress that it's in moderate to severe stroke, uh, thrombolysis it can be considered and should be given in those cases in pregnant women. Can I just ask the, the experts on the panel there a question? Um, this is the review of thrombolysis in pregnancy with 8% risk of major bleeding episodes. Is that similar to the, the general experience with TPA use? it'd be a little bit higher. So the standard sort of uh, quoted rate for hemorrhage uh, for all comers that receive thrombolysis, which would generally be a much older cohort, is about five or 6%. And that's old literature, it might even be a little bit lower, it depends how you define the symptomatic hemorrhage. And, but generally 5% is four to 5% is what we would generally you know, quote. So 8% would be a little bit higher. But yeah, also bearing in mind there was 12 cases. So if you have a small number of cases, of course. So it's not um, completely outside, shall we say, the established literature, notwithstanding the, the younger age. Thank you. Thanks, Carl. That's very reassuring for any of us on the stroke thrombolysis rota. Uh, and that will definitely help us. I, I also, I suppose, in the consent process, just to have a bit of an idea of the risk and benefit trade-off there. Um, I just had one other question for Cullum. Do you have any access to early supported discharge? Um, yeah, yeah, no. The, the, the problem for this lady was that uh, our speech and language therapist actually kept her in hospital a bit longer because they were making good progress and she was getting twice daily intensive speech therapy in hospital. And uh, she was anxious to go home, but our speech and language therapist felt that with intense uh, treatment from colleagues that she would benefit. So she went to a rehab unit uh, for uh, daily speech therapy, which wasn't going to be available in the community. Um, so she actually took her own early discharge uh, for other reasons that she wanted to get home. But she had incredibly intensive uh, speech therapy. That's the only deficit she had. Um, and for some reason, it was very difficult to organise daily speech therapy in the community. This was the major lesson from our point of view. And there's a big disconnect between the community care 
provision. And I think that the the triaging of uh, need, this uh, young woman would have needed daily speech and language support in the community and should have taken precedence over lots of other issues. But the system didn't seem to have that kind of flexibility that the hospital would have. So in short, that yes, there is support to discharge, but for her, not the kind of community support um, that she deserved. And what it brought to our attention is the lack of flexibility among some healthcare professionals in, in adjusting to patients' needs where they're outside their norm. In other words, most of the patient population they were dealing with were not necessarily young, would have been a lot older. And he was a very young person with a very selective neurological problem of an expressive dysphasia for which she was recovering and needed intensive speech support. So we were stuck with a, a system that didn't uh, necessarily meet her needs. So, yeah, I think we had the same experience in St. Column yeah. Hills and Lockton's Town, where we would have some patients who are younger, uh, and it's a real challenge for them to be in the environment, in the hospital environment, and try and rehabilitate well there. And then when we're trying to get the really supported discharge team involved, to try and, and make sure we have enough input from them. Uh, and very often we still do need to keep patients uh, as an inpatient for much longer than they need. Um, sorry, I interrupted somebody there. Is that you, Carl? Oh, sorry, Shane, I just had a, a question for Colin. A, a very good point about the early support of discharge. And uh, of course, we're all aware of trying to get patients out. So it's, it's interesting to, um, to hear about the... Um, the flexibility and maybe it's a, a conversation that uh, needs to be opened up a bit more. Um, no, Colin, my other question was the mother had a stroke at 42. Yeah. Um, was there anything, was that revisited in view of this diagnosis? Um, yeah, very interesting. This came to light quite late in the course. Uh, it, it came to light where uh, I actually was talking to the speech and language therapist about trying to get support uh, at, in the community. And uh, I wasn't over enthusiastic about her going to St. John's Rehab in, in a course. I'd prefer to get her home and get her community-based speech and language. But when it became apparent that this wasn't possible, the, my colleague outlined this story as an, more or less an anecdotal description of what happened on the morning. And that's where we had vaguely known that the mother had had a stroke at an early time. But it, I only became kind of clued into the fact that she was only 42 when it happened. She, she, has, she had a, a fairly devastating speech disturbance at that time um, and uh, has still residual expressive and receptive dysphasia. But we didn't, we haven't gone any further. Okay, and I see a, a comment in the chat from Jacinta Curley. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have an early uh, support discharge service in Wexford. We have no dedicated SLT to the stroke service. This cohort are absorbed by the current WTE. Yeah. We're incredibly under-resourced for stroke, 0 0.6 physio, one CNS stroke, four unprotected stroke beds. Incredibly understaffed and under-resourced. Um, so thank you, Jacinta, for that. Yeah, I think that's a very important issue. And there was a meeting here in Wexford on Tuesday, a strategy meeting where those deficits were outlined and I'm sure they're elsewhere also. The, the plans to up lift the service and bring in adequate space for stroke unit are driven by space requirements and staffing requirements. But as everybody's aware, since March, 2020, um, our, our hospital's functionality at all levels has been stretched. Um, the, the biggest thing now is to get the posts that are required identified, um, funded, and then the real challenge will be to actually fill those posts because it, it is even a challenge at the moment to find uh, candidates for jobs in, in hospitals like Wexford where larger centres and larger cities might be more attractive for uh, younger graduates. Thank you very much. Um, fascinating case. Thanks so much, Colin, for the, uh, the insight and to Maggie. And um, if there are no further questions on that case, um, we 
we might, uh, there's one other comment from Connor O'Keefe, um, just to remind the audience of the dissection associated stroke with atypical presentations in pregnancy and postpartum. So thanks, uh, Connor, for that. So um, I guess it's, you know, pregnancy, postpartum, increased risk of, of uh, uh, arterial dissection as well, which can present more atypically. So it's a, it's a matter of being clinically aware and particularly for staff in emergency departments um, uh, for atypical presentations in younger patients to take them seriously and get somebody senior involved and, and, and get them imaged uh, in a timely fashion. So thank you for that, Connor. Okay, I'll hand you back to Thanks, uh, Maggie, thank you. Um, so case number two, um, I'll just get started. This lady is a 40 year old woman, para one plus two, previous vaginal delivery in 2019. She is 39 weeks and two days and a no significant past medical or past surgical history. Um, her family history is significant for a brother that passed away uh, due to a brain tumor at age 25. She's a very fit and healthy woman, uh, BMI of 19 at booking and a normal blood pressure at booking. Uh, was deemed to be an uncomplicated low risk pregnancy and she was attending the Domino midwifery clinic. Uh, at 9.41 in the morning uh, this woman presented to the delivery ward in labour and had a baby 20 minutes later. Um, at 10.40 she was noted to have a right facial droop and weakness. Uh, the reg on call and consultant uh, were on the labour ward and attended immediately. On examination, vitals were normal. This woman was normal intensive. She was alert and oriented uh, and had a left-sided facial droop, uh, left upper limb weakness, power two out of five, and left lower limb weakness, power two out of five. She had upgoing plantars bilaterally and hyperreflexive on the right side and was uh, normal reflexes on the left. Her speech was intact and had no expressive or receptive dysphasia. So the impression was of stroke. Um, the obstetric reg phone 999 and um, protocol 37 was activated. This is an emergency inter-hospital transfer. So a decision was made to transfer the patient out immediately, uh, but where to was the question. This is really the critical moment in this case. So our current pathway for anyone with a medical issue in Hollis Street is they are sent directly to St. Vincent's and assessed by medical staff over there and have their imaging and management from uh, St. Vincent's. Um, but the window, but the feeling was this woman was having a stroke and the window for thrombolysis was closing. Um, drilling down into it, she had had uh, a right facial droop noted by the partner at 8.30 that morning. Um, and a thrombolysis was going to carry with it quite a, a risk of a morbid bleed. So um, the feeling was that this woman needed thrombectomy and um, this was echoed when the uh, paramedic arrived. He said it felt wrong to bring this woman to St. Vincent's. I knew how long it would take to get across the city in two directions. So uh, this was discussed with Beaumont, uh, the ED consultant was phoned, stroke reg, neurosurgery reg, uh, and the decision uh, was made to directly transfer this woman to Beaumont for neuroimaging and further management. So she arrived in Beaumont uh, at 11.45, and I have some times on this. So the times that I have are from the moment she uh, walked in the door of Beaumont. Um, so she had her non-contrast CT uh, at 15 minutes, uh, and this is, it shows a, um, an infarct of the right MCA. So it's a, an aspect score of seven, which dictates um, outcome um, from thrombectomy, uh, and it's affecting her right insula cortex. This is a reconstructed view of the woman uh, who had the CT angio, and it shows a complete occlusion of the right MCA and a, a normal um, flow into the left MCA, uh, as you can see clearly in this picture. Um, this is her intracranial uh, CT angio, uh, which shows the affected territory. This is a, an intra-procedural um, photograph uh, and on the left hand side is an unsubtractive view and the right hand side is a subtracted view uh, and you can see the uh, micro wire and the micro catheter uh, in place in the right um, internal carotid artery and I just have an image of the procedure itself. I just have to switch slides here. Um, so the um, aspiration wire is passed up here and you can see it um, coming into view. And so the thrombus was removed uh, with a single aspiration. Um, uh, 
And this is her post aspiration uh, CT angio, and you can see complete recanalization of the vessel. And this was at minute 43. This is her diffusion weighted MRI seen at two levels, uh, and you can see the uh, affected area on the right side. So the diagnosis in this case was a ischemic stroke due to infraction of the M1 segment of the right MCA. Uh, the time from door of Bowman to thrombectomy was 43 minutes, really remarkable care for this woman. She recovered very well post-procedure uh, and was discharged home day five with support from the stroke team and community midwives. Um, she was sent home on six weeks of Clexane um, and had complete resolution today of her symptoms. Uh, she has ongoing psychological effects from these events and is linked with the perinatal mental health service here uh, and is attending for a debrief with the obstetric consultant and the domino midwives in the coming weeks. So uh, large vessel occlusion, endovascular therapy we know uh, offers substantial benefit for patients with large vessel occlusion uh, and it has a really impactful number needed to treat of 2.6 to reduce disability by at least one level on the modified Rankin scale scale uh, and for all the obstetricians in this uh, audience uh, that means living with um, a complete dependent um, for care or, or completely independent uh, so it's really quite um, quite remarkable what can happen and uh, only 10% of patients with uh, an acute ischemic stroke are eligible for uh, endovascular thrombectomy so uh, we really cannot miss any of these patients um, and how we can change their outcome is with accurate triage and, and this is a this makes sense to all of us, I'm sure. Um, and in the hospital, we have different scoring systems. So the uh, NIHSS is widely used in hospitals in Ireland. Uh, and the FAST uh, campaign was very effective in Ireland as well. There is many, many um, scoring systems which try and accurately diagnose a large vessel occlusion. But really, the basics come down to when was the patient last seen well? What is the neurological deficit? Uh, the absence of a major pre-existing handicap uh, and the absence of seizures. So um, rethinking pathways, uh, the current model um, in uh, most cases in uh, across Ireland is the drip and ship model. Um, and this comes from a, a study. Uh, so the, the uh, kind of primary um, points on this would be to exclude a hemorrhagic stroke uh, with a non-contrast CT, commence thermolysis at that point, uh, do your CT angiography and transfer to an EVT capable centre at that point. Uh, this case in question was an example of a direct mothership. Uh, we have two EVT capable centres in Ireland, one in Cork and one obviously in Bowman. Um, and it, if we could identify these patients in the pre-hospital setting or um, in hospitals like Hollis Street or any maternity hospital who, who doesn't have the luxury of imaging, um, it would uh, account for a significant reduction in delays for this patient, um, for any patient. And um, this uh, graphic just is a very simplified version of uh, what uh, this could look like. We suspect a stroke, we suspect a large vessel occlusion, is it less than 24 hours? And the patient goes directly to an EBT capable centre. Uh, so this, if we were to implement this, it would require quite a lot of um, pre-hospital organisation and training of um, uh, paramedics or um, ambulance staff uh, resourcing. Obviously, we have to accept a very significant rate of overdiagnosis in, in these cases. We the uh, scoring systems um, are sensitive but not very specific, and so we would be identifying, you know, one in two patients who, who aren't capable, aren't suitable for a thrombectomy. Um, and in that setting, um, we have to have a return to sender um, pathway um, that the patient to where they came from or the hospital the catchment area, they would have to return back if they were to have been to Bowman for imaging and, and not deemed suitable for an end of uh, vascular thrombectomy. I think if you think of it in the case of this woman was having a STEMI, it would have been very clear, you know, to any every in the room where she would need to go if it was out of hours it would have been to St James's or the matter and there would have been no question on that however we need to be comfortable with over diagnosis and maybe getting it wrong at times because it could really have quite a significant impact on the patient's um, recovery and um, morbidity um, so I'm going to open the floor to um, some of the people that were influ uh, influential in this uh, so it's uh, Professor Boyle and Bowman and Dr Matt Crockett um, so I'd be interested to get your opinion and your the context Thanks, Maggie. It's really well presented. Um, so I was involved in the case from quite early on, although um, by the time I was involved in the case, the patient had already been, been accepted. And I think a huge um, 
huge kind of congrats or, or, or like huge kudos to the paramedic driver uh, and uh, for kind of redirecting things because that's where it really all started. We could see on the on the first CT that Maggie showed that there was an established uh, infarct. Um, so this lady did look like she was probably a reasonably rapid progressor in terms of in terms of her stroke. We don't know exactly when the onset was, but certainly there was an already established infarct there. So the fear was that if she'd gone all the way over to Vincent's um, and then would almost certainly have had to get back in the ambulance and come back over to us, you're talking about, you know, absolute best case scenario with best will in the world. You're talking about another 90 minutes plus um, to get her back over to Beaumont. So that almost certainly saved a significant chunk of, of this lady's brain. So huge kudos, I said, to the paramedic driver. And then I think the neurosurgical registrar in Beaumont was for some reason contacted and he also agreed that the patient should be coming straight to us. And then Dara and I think Imad, who the neuroradiology and, and, uh, uh, and stroke um, fellows um, also were, were contacted and, and accepted the patient. Um, and I think this case raises a lot of interesting issues as Maggie has as, as, um, kind of put in place there. Um, obviously, the diagnosis, as, as we've mentioned in Colm's case and Carl mentioned previously, the diagnosis of stroke in, in young patients in very unexpected uh, you know, situations is, is more difficult. Um, and this lady's kind of uh, pathway and outcome really demonstrates the, what, what we can achieve. Uh, with kind of a, a, a streamlined system. So all the time points in this case really are, are quite remarkable, looking at that 15 minutes to, to CT, which sounds like sounds like it could be a long time, but like it, it really isn't when we look at look at look at data in other cases. That's straight in the door and straight onto the table, really. Um, we had all our the clinical team pre-alerted and in ready to go. Um, I was made aware of the case by the by the um, uh, neuroradiology fellow who let me know. So then we called in the nurses um, in kind of readiness, assuming there would be something for us to do. Um, and then the actual procedure was is is the easy part. We're kind of used here to trying to get into the into the uh, in, intracranial arteries of eighty year old patients with very very twisty blood vessels. So it's quite a it's quite a luxury really to have a, a 40 year old patient with very very straight blood vessels that the, the catheter just flies up so i think it was about seven or eight minutes from groin puncture to actually getting the getting the clot out out in this lady so the procedure is kind of the easy bit here um i think it's all all the pre-procedural um uh, kind of time metrics in this case that really really made a huge difference to her um i think mag what maggie talks about in terms of in, in terms of cardiology and STEMIs that's a really really valid point I think thrombectomy really is only in reality seven or eight years old it's a very very new uh, procedure it was, it's been around longer than that but in reality the strong evidence we have for thrombectomy um, and Maggie again Maggie mentioned that year number needed to treat of 2.3 that's that's quite remarkable uh, compared to almost any other medical intervention really um, but the data we have is only from 2015. So we still really are learning, you know, kind of trying to find our feet in terms of how, how to provide this remarkable treatment to as many people as possible in as fast a time as possible. And I certainly think, although we don't have hard evidence of this yet, I think in a, in a condensed metropolitan uh, region uh, like Dublin is, uh, there really is increasing evidence that direct transfer to a thrombectomy centre can lead can lead to benefit. Now that that is with a few caveats that number one, the thrombectomy centre needs to be res resourced to take these patients. As Maggie mentioned, there's going to be at best a 50% hit rate at pre pre kind of uh, out of hospital um, uh, diagnosis, which would be by the paramedics uh, who um, who have tend to be very, very good and very, very kind of into this, but we will get like about 50%, only max 50% of people will have large vessel occlusion. So the hospital needs to be resourced to deal with that and probably send patients back who don't have a stroke to their local hospital. Um, and we'll, uh, what we also need to make sure is that by um, taking, you know, all these, you know, patients with, with significant symptoms, there's a few things we need to do. We need to not forget about some patients with milder symptoms who are going to, who might be going to the other hospitals um, who could still have a large vessel occlusion or still have a significant stroke. 
And by taking all the potential large vessel fusions to one place, we need to make sure that you know TPA rates and treatment of patients with milder strokes isn't affected. So there is there is a good bit of work to do here, and and um, but I really do think that this case um, kind of shines a light on what we could do in Dublin, and we could we we're doing very well at the moment um, on international standards, but we could have a really world class kind of thrombectomy service here, and we could be a, a um, a kind of, kind of an example to cities of similar size around the world um and it's it's nice to have a a, a kind of a case like this and, and, and a good news story fantastic um uh, case and management guys well, well done uh fa fascinating matt um so do patients because uh, I, 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 Maggie mentioned a figure of ten percent um, suitable for thr thrombectomy, but you, you, you're you're saying you're saying forty to fifty percent is more the figure. Oh, sorry. Or, so in terms of like, so about ten fifteen percent of patients with a stroke are probably suitable thr for thrombectomy. But if okay. we were if we were taking um, kind of all comers with a suspected stroke. Only yeah. about 40 or 50 percent of them would actually have an occlusion that we could get to, and the other maybe 50 to 60 percent might have a small distal occlusion we can't get to, or maybe okay. a mimic, like say, Colm was mentioned earlier about yeah. heavy migraine or, some, or something like that. I but, understand, um, yeah. yeah, no, no, it's just that the, the 10 because the 10 percent being suitable for uh, is it? I'm just, I'm just not clear on the 10 percent versus the. 40, 50%. As I understand if, if, it. If I, I can jump in there maybe. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we actually don't know the, the actual figure because it probably depends on how efficient our system of care is. If there's significant delays in the recognition of the stroke, the transport to the local hospital, the diagnosis, and then the transfer to the EVT center, a lot of patients who would be eligible will have gone through the time when they may not. So it's probably somewhere between 10 and 20% of all a patients who have stroke that would be eligible for thrombectomy. But I think the earlier people get to the thrombectomy center will maximize those numbers. The, the more inefficient your system is, you're going to lose people because of the time delays. The, the 40 to 50% is coming when we take in the, in the field, the paramedics trying to do a, a crude triage and skimming off the most severe strokes. So essentially patients who are hemiplegic and mute or have a head deviation and an eye deviation. So of that very, very severe uh, group with a crude scale in, in the field, uh, at best, 40 to 50% of them will end up having a large vessel occlusion. Gotcha. So okay. So will, be, will be mimics. Gotcha. So it's 10% for all comers, but 40, 50% with the severe clinical presentation. That's, yeah. that's very useful uh, information. And can I just ask, Matt, in Beaumont now, if somebody comes in with... Uh, a, a, a sort of acute stroke to the ED, would they go straight for thrombectomy without thrombolysis if it's suitable? So good, good question. And there is a lot of, a lot of uh, quite a few studies coming out on, in this area at the moment, but the short answer is at the moment, no. Um, I think all the, all the big studies that we're basing, uh, big randomized clinical trials that we're basing our practice on at the moment, um, in, indicate that TPA plus thrombectomy is the standard of care. Um, and that is kind of our, our procedure at the moment uh, in Beaumont. And it should be the procedure, uh, you know, that every country across the hospital, we're trying to, you know, we're trying to maximize TPA rates. So no one should have TPA withheld at present, if even if they are going coming over to Beaumont for a thrombectomy or if they're in Beaumont. Now, there's probably a very it's a small subgroup of patients, and this is where the evidence is really developing at the moment, that may, may the TPA maybe doesn't necessarily help them. Uh, so if you think about it, if there's a patient on the scanner, on the tape, CT scanner in Beaumont, they have a very large vessel occlusion, such as an ICA occlusion or a very proximal M1 occlusion. And we can get them onto the neuron, into the neuron geography suite in, you know, five minutes. Um, the TPA is unlikely to open that very large vessel that's blocked. And if we can have the, have the clot out very, very quickly, maybe there's a benefit of holding TPA. But we don't have evidence for that yet. Three trials have recently come out that have kind of been equivocal on that. So at the moment, standard of care is still TPA plus, plus thrombectomy. Thank you.
Um, Roger, here. can I can I ask just uh, is uh, Matt is Beaumont the only centre in Dublin doing uh, that acute thrombectomy, uh, and and if so, is there any plans to expand the service to, to other hospitals? And then also just a second question, following up on um, what Colin Quigley uh, had been saying, is that in a very young patient, um, uh, how do we? really uh, early distinguish uh, the, the severe migraine with aphasia and, and hemiplegia from, from soak, stroke, or do we just uh, assume it's, it's all stroke and really proven otherwise? Um, so to answer the first question, I suppose, yes, we're the only hospital in Dublin and definitely no plans to expand. I think this is, I think this should all be about whether it's thrombectomy or whether it's about um, the overall stroke service, I think centralization is, is, is the way forward. Um, we know from pretty much across the board, the more you do of any of anything, the better you get. Um, if you're only doing a handful of thrombectomies a year, then you're not going to be good at it. And yet we know from, from, from pretty good studies that the outcomes are worse. So at the moment, I think what we, what we should be doing rather than trying to expand it to other hospitals is, is, is centralize and, and bring the patients to us, especially within Dublin where, where you know you could have you could really be anywhere in Dublin within half an hour, forty minutes, really. So I think I think that's the that's the that's the plan. Cork, I've, I've just started running a twenty four seven service in the last six months, so we have two now uh, thrombectomy centres in in in, uh, in Ireland. I think that's probably about the right number. It's difficult when you're taking people from Letterkenny, uh, but the resources required to run a thrombectomy center 24 7 it's not just us the neurointerventionists it's very well trained nurses radiographers two nurses and a radiographer on call 24 7 and a, and a neuro neuroradiologist um to do a handful of thrombectomies a year really doesn't really doesn't add up so um yeah i think centralization is the way forward forward with this um i think to answer the other question i suppose i think imaging is really the mainstay of of uh of diagnosis, um, CT, CTA, and then advanced imaging techniques. So I suppose it's incredibly difficult as the physicians uh, 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 would, I'm sure, tell you to separate a, um, a stroke mimic from a stroke without uh, without CT and, and CT intracranial vascular vascular imaging. I think they should all be treated as as a uh, as a stroke until kind of proven otherwise. I suppose. Uh, if I could jump in just to make, make a few comments, I'm conscious that we may be running out of time, so I think it'd be remiss just to make a general comment before getting back to the case. For those that don't know, today is World Stroke Day, so October 29th is World Stroke Day, so we couldn't have a more appropriate day to be discussing this. It was uh, originally designed on the day because the World Stroke Organization was formed just in 2006, um, and the point of the day is to raise awareness of the signs of stroke and the importance of timely access to care. So I think we couldn't have a better case that really highlights all of those issues. And what we're talking about now is large vessel occlusion. And I think the way I, I view that is these are really the, the severe end of the spectrum of stroke. And for the patient, this is the worst day of their life and probably the worst day of, you know, maybe their family's lives as well. And, and the mantra we have in stroke is time is brain. Every minute is critical. You know, we, we estimate that on average two million neurons per minute are lost in the setting of a large vessel occlusion, actually in people who have per collaterals or what we call fast progressors, that could be 27 million euros. So every minute counts. The best analogy I think is to, to think of the fire, you know, the fire brigades and the system we have if there's a fire and how that system is geared to not reduce any time to get the ambulance to, the, to the, where the fire is. And this is a fire going on in somebody's brain. So we have to organize our system of care to really maximize the outcome. I think there was a question about uh, how many thrombectomies are done in Beaumont, and it maybe ties into the issue about how many centers we need. I'd absolutely agree with Matt that the two centers and one in Dublin is all that we need. We need to centralize stroke to optimize uh, outcomes. Uh, Beaumont performs over 300 thrombectomies a year, Cork about 80. Uh, in 2020, the average time for a thrombectomy procedure in Beaumont was 27 minutes. So Matt is really selling himself and his colleagues very short when he says things like it's very easy just to go straight up and take out the clot. And the expertise that is involved in thrombectomy and that we are so fortunate to have is not only comparable to international standards, it's way ahead of international standards. So most 
countries and jurisdictions are struggling with, they don't have the experts to do this procedure. We're very fortunate in Beaumont and Cork that we have the people to do the procedure. So now we need to optimize our system of care to get patients where they need to go as quickly as possible and the concept of to the, you know, the right patient to the right hospital. And this case is an amazing case. It highlights really, I think, how the future could look for stroke and for any person who's having a severe stroke and having that worst day of their life, the potential outcomes if we optimize the system. Uh, this occurred on a weekend. I was on call as well. And uh, so even on a weekend, the metrics for this case were off the chart. And I think the door to reperfusion, so the vessel being open was 44 or 43 minutes. If we just compare that to the first case, the door to needle time in that case was 98 minutes. So even coming in and having a much more complicated procedure, you know, can be done incredibly fast. And I think that's what we believe in Beaumont, that because we're, you know, dealing with such a high volume of patients, that we can even be faster and traveling an extra 10, 15 minutes uh, will not uh, harm patients in any meaningful way and will uh, be able to treat people faster probably because it would be much more efficient when the patients get here and then we'll have direct access to thrombectomy for those patients that are really having uh, the, the most severe stroke uh, with the large vessel occlusion that are, are eligible. And so I, I think the, the sort of metrics and the way this case panned out with such a phenomenal outcome for this uh, young woman really gives us a glimpse into how the future could look, although it's complicated and there's lots of uh, issues and resources that are required. But the model is really following this, you know, what happens in the cardiology world with STEMIs and SP elevation MIs. And, and it's, just, it's just about how to select out those patients and having the appropriate pathways and having the appropriate resources to follow. Uh, so that really, you know, no large vessel occlusion is left behind. We don't miss any uh, and we minimize the time to treatment uh, for you know, really everyone that's having this worst, very severe kind of stroke. Thanks very much, Carl. Um, very uh, um, strong message there and very appropriate day to be delivering it. So re really appreciate that. Um, there was one question about um, patient was uh, on Plexane. I think the, the second patient was, was uh, discharged on Plexane, but I think it may have been a prophylactic dose. I'm not sure. Um, but if the, I don't know if the obstetricians or anybody else want to comment on on that yeah i'm pretty sure this is jenny walsh in nmh i'm pretty sure that was a prophylactic dose based on on additional risk factors obviously yeah. in terms of her own maternal age and, and delivery yeah. complications i think that's where where that came from but she, she would have been on aspirin as well presumably and presume so now she's back to us yeah. next week she's done remarkably well i mean this case really um in the end went went extremely well and a huge thanks to carl and his team and matt and his team for that she, she's made a, a remarkable recovery um, and yes, is a little bit upset and traumatized by the, the, the what might have been, but overall has done exceptionally well and, and obviously has her two healthy babies now. Um, just a, a note, obviously, I think this, um, we've had a little bit of backwards and forwards on this uh, drip and ship and, and straight to mothership, which were completely new, new terms to most of us in, in NMH, um, but it certainly seems to make sense. In the shorter term, um, just for Carl and, and Matt, is this something that we should be doing in the immediate, obviously, this is extremely rare. Our default will be, it'll be a different team on call the next time. The default will probably go the same pathway in terms of contacting Vincent's, who are equally as obliging and as quick at accepting the referral and getting things set up there. But how do we get the message across in the short term for the very few cases that we'll have in standalone units without access to imaging um, to, to try? Had we not had that particular paramedic on that day, who had actually just left, he dropped another woman to, to a different labor ward room a couple of minutes earlier. So everything really ran in her favor in terms of time. But had he not suggested it, it wouldn't have entered our minds to go directly to, to Bow Mountain, obviously. And things were expedited much more quickly for her then. I've no doubt that has had a huge impact on her outcome. In the short term, is that something we just take that lesson on board in NMH? Can we get a message out to, to the other maternity centers or do we wait for, for a larger uh, uh, campaign here? Well, maybe I'd say that you can help, you know, to, to, to start and, and drive the campaign. There is a body of work going on within Dublin looking at a bypass model uh, for the metropolitan area uh, of Dublin and really looking to have this exact model uh, where the paramedics would uh, do a, a sort of scale in the field and would call Beaumont to, to have a discussion if the patient's suitable to, to come directly to Beaumont. And so, so I think, uh, you know, flagging this case, 
uh, formally, uh, you know, uh, raising at appropriate levels within HSE and certainly to, to Beaumont and uh, ask, you know, sort of asking or demanding the need to develop this clinical pathway because we have an example now of, of how well it can work. Um, but I think we'd be a little bit reticent about just getting up and running with, uh, you know, patients who've had a neurological uh, spell, uh, you know, in the in maternity hospitals all coming to Beaumont. So I, I think there's a few steps to go through, but I think we really should be maximizing this case to really drive the, the service. And, um, you know, we're advocating for, for this model of care at Beaumont. We believe it is the, the best uh, future care for, for strokes. And, but we're quite, I guess, early on in the, in the process of, uh, you know, everything that has to happen. And, and obviously that can be quite frustratingly slow, uh, the pace of change. And it's very interesting that the paramedics were the people, you know, who were identifying this patient and sort of saying, because they're used to dr driving these patients to hospital A and then an hour, two hours later, picking them up and bringing them to, to Beaumont. And so I, I think it's important to, to really uh, look at how we can use this case to help drive those changes that are required to our current systems of care. Perfect, thank you. Um, no further questions, um, and uh, unless anybody has any further comments, um, I'd just like to say thank you very much to, uh, to Maggie and uh, Colin, Matt and Roger, um, Carl and Jennifer and Fanula, everybody who contributed to the discussion this morning. Fascinating cases and great, uh, great outcomes. Um, so well done to all the clinicians involved. Um, so uh, just a quick, uh, one more question, history of DVT on a Pixaban, uh, giving TPA window for stroke. Um, I think, that's probably a, another day's discussion, but I think it would depend on the, the timing and uh, of the dose and the individual presentation and the stroke position involved. I'm not a stroke position, but would that be fair to say, Carl? Yeah, and, and at the moment, I mean, the evidence is changing a little bit, but at the moment, if they've taken it within 48 hours is the sort of guideline at the minute, TPA is contraindicated. I think that is a, a longer time window than many of us would believe, but if they've taken a Pixaban recently, it's a contraindication to some of the Okay. Well, thank you very much to everybody. Um, great That's discussion. Great. And um, th uh, thanks for highlighting World Stroke Day and the, uh, you know, we, we can, uh, thanks to Connor for highlighting the, uh, the risk of uh, dissection and peripartum and pregnancy and uh, just to remind us all just to to look for these acute cases um, recognize problem early address the problem early take the symptoms seriously and get people to the right place um, at the right time so thanks to everybody thanks thanks everyone Thank thanks you. maggie cheers thanks maggie well done cheers thanks maggie uh, and uh, just to say, the next um, IEHG Grand Rounds will be presented by Wexford at the, uh, on the last Friday in November. And we're doing this every la the last Friday of every month and circulating between different hospitals. Um, anything further to comment on that, Shane? Oh, that's it. A few great cases coming up next month from Wexford. And then we'll be looking for other hospitals to help us out in the new year as we go around the whole group. Great. Okay. Have a good have a good morning, good weekend. Thank you to everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye everyone.